Hello, I'm Chris Morosky. This video is titled Abnormal Uterine Bleeding. It is part of our Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Conference Series. This conference is produced and normally presented with Dr. Elizabeth Deckers from Hartford Hospital. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Review older terms for abnormal uterine bleeding. Understand the newer FIGO classification for abnormal uterine bleeding, palm coin. Describe the workup of an adolescent patient presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding. Discuss treatment options for patients with von Willebrand disease and solve an interprofessional education obstacle. In this video, we will follow along with our patient, LB. Let's learn a little bit more about LB. LB is a 15-year-old female who presents for evaluation of heavy menstrual periods. Her first menstrual period occurred at age 14 years, 6 months. She states that it was terrifying because there was so much blood and she was changing her pad every hour for 3 days. She had her second menstrual period one week ago and again reports changing saturated pads every hour for three to four days. She is on the varsity swim team at her high school and had to miss practices while on her period. She is worried that she will be cut from the team if she misses any more practices. What is in your differential diagnosis and what physical exam would you perform? So before we talk more about our differential diagnosis and physical exam, Let's review some of the older terminology that was previously used to describe abnormal uterine bleeding. Here in this slide, you can see some older terms and definitions for abnormal uterine bleeding. The term menorrhagia is used to describe excessive uterine bleeding. This can either be menstrual bleeding that goes on for greater than seven days or greater than 80 cc's of blood loss. In the past, the terms heavy menstrual bleeding and hypermenorrhea were also used to describe excessive uterine bleeding. Metrorrhagia was used to describe irregular uterine bleeding, and this could really include anything outside of the regular 21 to 35 days of the normal menstrual cycle. Another term previously used to describe metrorrhagia was intermenstrual bleeding. Oligomenorrhea was used to describe a cycle length greater than 35 days. These patients would usually have approximately 4 to 9 menses per year, less than the expected 12 menses per year. Similarly, polymenorrhea was used to describe a cycle length less than 21 days. These patients would obviously have more than 12 menstrual periods per year. And hypomenorrhea was used to describe light or scant uterine bleeding. Commonly, these patients would also have somewhat irregular periods. The International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics decided to reclassify abnormal uterine bleeding according to this new palm coin classification system. Let's take a closer look at what this means. In this slide, you can see that abnormal uterine bleeding is broken up into two main components. The first are structural abnormalities, and the second are functional abnormalities. In the next several slides, we'll go through all of the different characteristics of abnormal uterine bleeding as described by the palm coin classification system. On the structural side, the P in palm stands for polyp. Polyps are most commonly endometrial polyps, but also can be endocervical polyps. Polyps are benign growths that come from the glandular epithelium of the endometrium or the endocervix. They commonly have a fibrovascular stalk and a very fleshy tip. These polyps can bleed very heavily during menses. In the photographs to the right are two classic pictures of endometrial polyps as seen at the time of hysteroscopy. The A in palm stands for adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is a structural abnormality when the endometrial glands grow into the myometrial or muscular portion of the uterus. As can be seen in the picture on the right in A, this is a gross histologic specimen of a uterus where it can clearly be seen that the endometrium is growing very far into the myometrium or muscle of the uterus. The photomicrograph in B shows endometrial stroma and glands growing into the muscular portion of the uterus as well. Adenomyosis is associated with heavy and often very painful menses. Next is leiomyoma for the L and palm. 
Glioblastoma are common, benign, smooth muscular growths arising from the smooth muscle of the uterus. In the picture to the right, you can see these multiple rubbery world growths that are arising from the muscle of the uterus. We could have a whole entire lecture on fibroids because they're very common, but fibroids are often classified by their location within the uterus. Fibroids just under the visceral peritoneum of the uterus are called subserosal. Fibroids mostly within the muscle of the uterus are called intramural. And fibroids abutting the endometrial lining of the uterus are called submucous. It is really the submucous fibroids that are responsible for abnormal uterine bleeding. Finally, the M in palm stands for malignancy. As can be seen in this picture, there is a malignancy arising from the endometrium of the uterus. Endometrial hyperplasia is also included in the M under palm, as this is often a precursor to malignancy. The workup for structural causes of abnormal uterine bleeding includes a history, physical exam, ultrasound of the pelvis, and endometrial sampling. This can be performed by pipel aspiration in the office or with DNC hysteroscopy in the operating room. Okay, moving on to the functional causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. The first one is coagulopathy. This can either be caused by liver disease or platelet dysfunction. Next, the O in coin stands for ovulatory dysfunction. This picture shows the ultrasound findings of a polycystic appearing ovary on ultrasound, and polycystic ovarian syndrome accounts for the majority of ovulatory dysfunction. However, conditions such as hyperprolactinemia, hyper and hypothyroidism, obesity, anorexia, the female athlete triad and such also are causes for ovulatory dysfunction. The E in palm coin stands for endometrial. If you boil this down enough, it pretty much stands for endometritis. It makes sense that chlamydia trachomanus can live on the cervix, and it also can ascend and cause salpingitis. In a similar way, chlamydia trachomanus, nyssaceria gonorrhea, and other bacteria from the vagina can cause a low-level endometritis that does not cause an overwhelming infection, but can lead to heavy and often painful uterine bleeding. The I in the coin stands for iatrogenic. These are different medications that patients will take that often can lead to abnormal uterine bleeding. As gynecologists, we see this a lot with our progestin-only contraception, such as IUDs, implants, Depo-Provera, and progesterone-only birth control pills. Other medications that fall here include anticoagulants, such as heparin or Coumadin. Finally, there is the category of not yet classified. In the image to the left is very obvious AV malformations of the uterus. In fact, you can see the severely dilated left ovarian vein going up into the left renal vein. Functional causes of abnormal uterine bleeding are usually worked up with a history and physical exam and then following up with serum laboratory values and sometimes additional radiologic imaging. All right, well, there you have it. That's a good review of palm coin and the new standardized approach to abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay, as part of the next steps, you are supposed to come up with a differential diagnosis for LB's abnormal uterine bleeding and think about what physical exam you'd want to perform. Given LB's young age, the differential diagnosis of LB's abnormal uterine bleeding would include the following. Pregnancy, anovulatory uterine bleeding, polycystic ovarian syndrome, von Willebrand disease, immune thrombocytopenia, other causes of secondary thrombocytopenia, and platelet dysfunction. Here are the results of the physical exam that should have been performed for our patient LB. Vital signs. Her height is 5 feet 6 inches and she weighs 190 pounds. Her blood pressure is 100 over 60, her pulse is 50, her respiratory rate is 18, and she is afebrile with a temperature of 98.9 degrees Fahrenheit. On general appearance, she is a well-developed adolescent female in no acute distress. Her HENT exam includes no scleral ectoris, no thyromegaly, and normal hearing bilaterally. Her cardiovascular exam is regular rate and rhythm with no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Her chest exam is clear to auscultation bilaterally with no wheezes. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, and non-distended. And on pelvic exam, she has Tanner stage 4 pubic hair distribution a normal clitoris, normal labia minora majora, a normal urethra, 
a normal vagina and cervix, and she has a small mobile uterus on bimanual exam with no pelvic masses appreciated. What additional tests would you like to order? Again, given LB's young age, it is not very likely that a structural abnormality is the cause of her bleeding. However, a pelvic ultrasound is appropriate. Also, we'd want to consider different serum laboratory values to work up possible functional causes of our abnormal uterine bleeding, such as anovulation or coagulopathy. All right, so let's check out the results of the additional testing that we would have seen for our patient, LB. On pelvic ultrasound, she has a normal appearing uterus with no masses and a thin endometrial stripe measuring 8 millimeters. She has normal bilateral ovaries without cysts or masses. Her lab work reveals the following. Her urine pregnancy test is negative. Her CBC reveals the following. A white blood cell count of 6,700, which is normal. A hemoglobin of 8.2, which is low. A hematocrit of 26.8%, which is also low and a platelet count that is normal at 250,000. The results of her CBC show that she is anemic and her heavy uterine bleeding is likely significant. Her PT and INR, as well as APTT and fibrinogen are all normal. A von Willebrand panel shows the following results. Plasma von Willebrand factor antigen, less than 30%. This is significantly decreased. Plasma von Willebrand factor activity or Ristocetin cofactor activity also is less than 30% and this is significantly decreased. Her factor 8 activity is only mildly reduced. She has a normal serum TSH. What is your treatment plan? In putting together the results of LB's normal physical exam and pelvic ultrasound, as well as her lab findings of significantly decreased von Willebrand factor antigen and activity, as well as her relatively normal factor 8 level, she has most likely type 1 von Willebrand disease. Let's very briefly review von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand disease can be broken up into three different types. Type 1 is the most common and affects approximately 75-85% to 85 of people with von Willebrand disease. With type 1 von Willebrand disease, there is a quantitative decrease in von Willebrand factor. This results in a decrease in the concentration and activity of von Willebrand factor. Type 2 is the second most common type of von Willebrand disease. This affects approximately 15-20% to 20 of patients with von Willebrand disease. In type 2 von Willebrand disease, there is a qualitative dysfunction of von Willebrand factor. There are also four subtypes, subtypes A, B, M, and N. I'm not going to go into all of these in this video. If you want to learn more about that, check that out. Importantly, for the most part, these patients mostly have a normal quantity of von Willebrand factor. It's just that it doesn't work that well for various different reasons. All right, and then there's type 3, which is the least common type. Type 3 von Willebrand disease patients have a complete absence of von Willebrand factor. They also have very low factor 8 levels. These patients have severe bleeding and often present very similarly to hemophilia A type of patients. All right, moving on to treatment. When discussing treatment, we really need to think about what is the gynecologist going to do and then what is the hematologist going to do. So since I'm a gynecologist, we're first going to talk about the gynecologic treatment plan for a teenager with menorrhagia and type 1 von Willebrand disease. For teenagers here, the focus really is going to be on hormonal contraception. These patients are able to take most all forms of hormonal contraception. These would include oral contraceptive pills, both combination oral contraceptive pills with both estrogen and progestin, or progestin-only contraceptive pills. Other progestin-only options include levonorgestrel IUDs, the Nexplanon implant, and Depo-Provera. These latter three options are more likely to provide amenorrhea and therefore can help the patient with having little to no menstrual bleeding. For patients who are after their childbearing years, endometrial ablation and hysterectomy are options. But for our adolescent patient LB, these would not be options for her right now we would really want to stick with offering her different forms of hormonal contraception as long as she had no other contraindications to these medications. All right, so clearly this patient needs to be referred to a hematologist. She's not going to have Ravant Willebrand's disease managed by her gynecologist. It's not a really good idea. 
the treatment plans that a hematologist is going to discuss with a teenager with menorrhagia and type 1 von Willebrand disease are the following. If she does not want to go on hormonal contraception, she can use antifibrinolytic agents such as tranexamic acid during her menstrual periods. Tranexamic acid inhibits multiple plasminogen binding sites. This can greatly reduce the amount of bleeding with each menses. It needs to be taken three times daily on all of the days that she's having her menstrual period. Another option for these patients is intranasal DDAVP. This needs to be taken once daily on days one through three of the menses. Finally, with severe heavy vaginal bleeding during the period, brief courses on von Willebrand factor concentrate replacement or recombinant von Willebrand factor may be appropriate. At this time, this is pretty much being used in research studies. Usually with a combination of hormonal contraception provided by the gynecologist and DDAVP provided by the hematologist, these patients' abnormal uterine bleeding caused by their type 1 von Willebrand disease can be managed successfully. All right, and now it's time to go over our interprofessional education obstacle. Your patient's parents have jobs and make too much money to qualify for Medicaid, but cannot afford private health insurance premiums. Thus, your patient has no insurance. How are you going to get her the well-coordinated care that she needs to treat her von Willebrand disease? Well, the solution here for our patient LB is the patient financial services financial counselor. Your hospital financial counselor assists your patient and her parents with obtaining CHIP, also known as the Children's Health Insurance Program, which provides coverage for her appointments for hematology and prescriptions for her oral contraceptive pills and DDAVP. Financial counselors often work for hospitals. They can be extremely helpful to patients in helping them through affording health care coverage. They can help patients apply for Medicaid or Medicare. They can help patients apply for insurance coverage on the market. And in this case, they can help patients figure out the CHIP application. Financial counselors are also helpful to patients who have major hospital costs due to hospitalization or who have upcoming very expensive procedures or surgeries that are life-threatening. Knowing about your hospital financial counselor will help you provide health care to your patients who have difficulties paying for health care services that they need for their overall health. All right, everybody. Good job taking care of our patient, LB, who presented with abnormal uterine bleeding caused by her type 1 von Willebrand disease. We were able to get her good care and not put her parents into extreme debt by working with our hospital financial counselor. Before we get out of here, let's once again review our goals and objectives of this video. Review older terms for abnormal uterine bleeding. Understand the newer FIGO classification for abnormal uterine bleeding, palm coin. Describe the workup of an adolescent patient presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding. Discuss treatment options for patients with von Willebrand disease. And solve an interprofessional education obstacle. Excellent work. We hope you found that this video educational. Thanks for watching. Good luck with all of your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Bye-bye.